Hello, Mother. We're back again after our break. Yes. And we can either, we need to figure out there's some stuff you wanted to include about your time in Selby. So we probably should revisit that before we move on to when you met Dad, your loving husband, Ray. Okay. So if you want to delve into that Selby stuff, that would be great. There are just basically two things that I think I should have remembered earlier. One was the school picnic at the end of the school year, the last day of school. It was kind of a potluck arrangement for the school kids, and the grades one through eight had a big school picnic all by themselves. <laughs> at Hidden Wood Lake, which was a little creek that had been dammed up and formed a nice lake. It had trees around it, and the water was clear, and it had enough water, so it was a nice, nice swimming area. And they had a bathhouse, and they also had a shelter that had four opening windows to lay your food on so people could come and pick up their food. Okay. So every family was supposed to uh, bring something to add to the picnic. Mother always made a huge roaster of baked beans with a ham hock and they were just a real hit every year. <laughs> we never had any leftovers of the beans. Mm. Other people would bring chocolate cake or potato salad, um, whatever they had it, that they could contribute. There was also what is now known as a barbecue pit for roasting uh, wieners. And somehow we had wieners and buns and hamburgers. However that happened, it was a miracle, but <laughs> <laughs> that happened. And so it was always a big day. You, there was a playground with a slide and a seesaw, teeter-totter, and swings, and there was a baseball diamond, or softball is what we played. And there was a bridge across the creek so you could walk around the lake, which was quite a hike. Um, what do you so mean by you'd quite go, a hike? Like half a mile or a mile or? Probably a good mile. Oh, wow. Go around the lake. And back. Well, that's pretty big then. Yeah, it what was. What was the name of this lake? Hidden Wood. H-I-D-D-E-N. Hidden Wood. Because it was down in a... Uh, sort of a little valley, hmm. and it was a real... at the computer, and there's an awful lot of lakes in that area. <laughs> well, Surpri this... Surprisingly. Yeah, well, this was a community development for picnicking and swimming, because they had a little beach, and they had this house where you could change into your swimsuit. And it was a, always a lovely day. Rarely did we ever get rained out. Hmm. But I never so remember. Is this like northwest of Selby? Hidwood. Uh, it was northeast. So, Anna, I have to tell you about your mother's swim in the lake. She was determined, Luann was determined that she was going to be the first person to swim in the lake. And she was going to swim across the lake and back because she was a good swimmer. So she took the bicycle one spring day and bicycled all the way out to the lake, which was probably four miles. Yeah, well, that's a fair and distance on those old she clunker had bikes. Her swimming so long, so I put her swimsuit on, and the water had barely thawed, the ice had barely gone out. She swam all the way across 
the lake and back. And in the meantime, mother wondered where Luann was and she asked me and I had to tell her that Luann had gone to the lake to swim. So we had to quickly get in the car and go to the <laughs> lake. And there was Luann sitting. She'd made her swim. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How so, old was she roughly? Well, we were still in Selby, so she must have been 15, 16 years old. And where did she initially learn to swim then? Well, we had to go to Mobridge and take swimming lessons because they had a swimming pool. And so when mother had saved enough for gas, enough coupons for gas, we would load up the car with us kids and a friend or two, so it was really a packed group. Yeah. <laughs> and drive to Mobridge and spend the afternoon and have swimming lessons. So that's wow. how we learned to swim. And Did then have... after we learned to after we learned to swim, then we could swim at the lake. Okay. Did other families contribute their gas ration cards to this no. expedition? No. No. Just out of the goodness of our heart. We were the place that everybody played. Oh, the popular house. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because there were so many of us. Yeah. Huh, okay. So, those are the... Wow, that was quite generous. Anna, say that again. That was quite generous of your parents. Quite yes, generous, it was. yeah. Yeah. But Mother always thought it was easier to keep track of you if you were home. That's true. Uh-huh. Keeps out of trouble. But we often were out in the neighborhood playing, and when she wanted us home, she'd start hollering for us. <laughs> All the neighbors could hear. <laughs> kind of like the suey pig holler. Yeah. <laughs> suey, suey, suey. <laughs> Not exactly, yeah, well. but <clears throat> she would holler for us. Get it before I throw it in the creek. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> sort of that sort of thing, yeah. That was one of her sayings that, yeah, I heard. Yes. <laughs> so those are two stories that I had forgotten to, to relate. Okay. So Mulbridge is about maybe 10 miles from Selby? No, it was, 20, it was 25 miles west, sitting on the Missouri River. And it was called Mulbridge because they had a bridge across the Missouri River. So it was Mo Bridge. That's how it got its name. That's kind of clever. Yeah. Well, that's almost too obvious. Yeah, cleverly, obviously clever, cleverly obvious. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, <laughs> now we can move on, I guess. I have. I don't know, unless the, you guys have any more Snippets Question. of Selby land you want to hear about? This is your last chance. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, now we're going to catapult back to mom graduating from Colorado Women's College in Denver, Colorado. Right. And during those summer times, you worked in Yellowstone Park. The first summer and then the second summer. Correct. So you want to talk a little bit about that because that's where you met Ray, your your husband. Okay, I knew where she, where she met the dashing young fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, the dashing young fisherman and bus driver. And yeah. Bus driver. So <laughs> I knew I had to earn some money and. Dad had wanted me to come back home and sell parts to the farmers for the summer, and I knew I couldn't um, drain his resources any more than I already had for college. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to have some, earn some money of my own, and so I applied to Yellowstone Park 
for a job and lo and behold I got a job as a cabin maid at Mammoth. At Mammoth you start up from Gardner you start up the hill to Mammoth and just before you make that final turn and that final ascent up to the level of Mammoth there were cabins down below which were cheaper but they were perfectly fine little cabins for tourists. So that's where I was hired to clean cabins the first summer. And because there was no cafeteria down there, it was just an office building to register tourists, um, we all had to go up to the bus driver's cafeteria for our meals and they would send a bus down at mealtime to pick us up. And there were probably about 15 of us down there working, cleaning cabins. So the bus drivers would all be lined up and we'd be lined up to, to get into the cafeteria when it opened. And the bus drivers kept teasing and trying to communicate with the girls. Well, some of the girls were more readily available to that sort of chatter than I was. <laughs> and oh, wow. they were mostly all college boys anyway, and fraternity boys, etc. But it was your father was in the mix with all of those bus drivers. And <clears throat> so at, in the evenings, after everybody was done working, we would go down to Gardner and hang out in the bars and socialize. So we would, as girls, we didn't have a car. Only some of those bus drivers had a car. And so the girl, as girls, we would hitchhike down to Gardner. It was never hard to get a ride because that's what you did in, the, in those days, and it was perfectly safe. So we would go down there, and the bus drivers would be in the bar <laughs> with a, the mix of us. Savages is what we were called. They called you guys savages? Uh-huh. You women? Yeah. I have, the employees were savages, okay? All oh, of them. Really? Yeah. wonder where that came from. I don't know, but... <laughs> anyway, that's how I met your father, in a bar. <laughs> in Gardner. How'd you meet? Oh, in a bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, occasionally, he'd be in in the bar, not always, because they drove around the park and would stop at different places in the park. But whenever he was back in Mammoth, he'd come down to Gardner, and we kind of got to know each other and mm -hmm. visited, also visited with a whole bunch of other guys, of course, getting really social. Social butterfly. Yes. <laughs> And in our off hours, we would hitchhike down to the Firehole River, which was near Old Faithful, because there was a spot there that had sort of a grassy beach, and you'd take your towel and wear your bathing suit over under your clothes and go down there and sun for lay out in the sun for a while, and then you would get in the warm river and float down a ways and then get out and walk back to your towel. And it was a very popular place, so I met a lot of people there. And it was kind of between, the river came kind of between two tall rocks there. Mm -hmm. And the boys, of course, would get up on the rocks and jump down into the river. 
Was yeah. there a deep enough dive hole there? I didn't see them diving. They jumped. But, and so, but, I mean, was it? It was enough water that that was a safe thing to do, <laughs> to show off. <laughs> yeah. So we spent a lot of afternoons there and hitchhiked back. Next day, get up, have breakfast, go back down, clean the cabins, change the beds. Um, and one of the boys would have to bring new wood in, clean the stove and bring new wood, because they all had a little wood burning stove for heat. Okay. And uh, we had to clean the shower. There was a community shower oh. and bathroom. Sure. Yeah, they did have plumbing. <laughs> yeah, but not not the ensuite units as they have nowadays. You no. Know. Yeah. And we spent, if we didn't go down to the fire hole in the afternoons, we could go down to, there was a little creek that came down from the mammoth. Uh, terraces. Terraces. Yeah. And it was warm. Yeah. And uh, we could go sit by the creek and sun. <laughs> Suntan. I'm surprised you don't have a bunch of skin cancer because, man, there wasn't such a thing as sunscreen back in your time that early. No. No. Hmm. So, well, we used baby oil. Yeah, the fry. Uh-huh. <laughs> the fry oil. <laughs> God. So that was kind of that first summer what we did. I don't remember how much we were paid. Yeah. But um, enough. It was enough that I could help pay my tuition. Mm -hmm. So the second summer I went back and I was then able to be a waitress at Old Faithful Lodge, which was uh, kind of a, not the poor people's food, but the middle income people would eat at the lodge. At and Old Faithful? Up, at Old Faithful. Oh. And the upscale people all had the dining room in the inn. Oh, the big, yes, yeah. of course. So It's a pretty fancy um, dining room. But I made a lot of tips. I was a good waitress, very friendly and prompt and whatever ma makes a good waitress. I, that was me. So I lived in a dormitory with the girls, and this one girl from Alabama was kind of my roommate in the dormitory. Oh. And hmm. then in the dining room, we all had a certain station of tables that we were our responsibility. And one day, my roommate, I can't remember her name, but she was a sorority girl from Alabama University. And she came stomping back to our um, station and said, I ain't waiting on no niggers. And I said, what? <laughs> she said, I'm not waiting on no niggers. I said, well, well, I'll wait on them. So she said, go ahead. So I did. And it turned out that it was the doctor and his wife from Alabama that were touring. And, and they just happened to be black. Yes, they just yeah. happened to be black. Ugh. And she just wasn't about to take care of them. Yeah. So I visited, chatted with them. Mm -hmm. And they were just lovely people, of course. Yeah. They were people. Yeah. They were, I didn't know any different about black people. This was before the civil rights movement. Nothing had ever been said that, to me that yeah. you didn't associate with black people. And they were seated. Before the civil rights era, and yeah. Jim Crow was well known at that time. Oh yeah, yeah, big time. Yeah. So you had to know that what she was talking about. Yeah. Oh, I did know that, yeah. But I couldn't figure out why she wouldn't do it. <laughs> because she came from the environment where it was not. Yeah, that's, that's she came from Alabama. Back then. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. She came from Alabama. Yeah. So, um, so that was part of my cultural experience, too, with uh, 
bigoted people. Yeah. And they had been seated in the dining room yeah. with everybody else. What was the problem? The hostess seated them. Well, probably because the rest of you guys were not from the Deep South. Or the people that were yeah. associating with them. Well, yeah. I don't know. But after hours, there was a lot of drinking, of course, by everybody was underage. <laughs> was it 21 still back then? Yes, it was 21. Oh, wow. Yeah. But that didn't seem to make much difference to the park administration. They turned a blind eye to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as everybody was doing their job, that ah, they didn't care. <laughs> yeah, they just wanted people to do their job and get stuff done. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so what did you, uh, how did you and Dad start dating that second summer for real? Well, at the end of the first summer, um, I, well, we just decided we'd write to each other. So we did. And someplace I have his love letters. <laughs> oh, we have to find those. Anna, when you come to visit in the fall, we'll have to have ha read the love letters. <laughs> okay, go ahead. And by the end of the second summer, uh, we were pretty well committed to each other. And he said, well, he had graduated, and he said, well, if you come to Missoula and finish school, I'll stay there and get a job while you finish school. So he got a job at the Mercantile selling overalls in the basement. <laughs> in the basement? Uh -huh. Oh, fisherman overalls, no yes, doubt. <laughs> right. And he did that for quite some time. And the second year, I had to... Well, I did. I finished in at Christmas time, but Ray's father was based in Billings then, and he said to Ray, "You know, they really need extra mail help at the railroad for the Christmas mail that comes in." So, and they paid well. The railroad did. So, Ray packed up the red convertible. Oh yeah with practically everything we owned, which all fit in the convertible, and went to Billings about the second week in December. So I was left there with no car <laughs> and taking classes to finish up my degree. And I had to walk Two back questions. and forth. What? Two questions. Did you graduate? What was your degree in middle of? It was a basic education, music background. So it was a BA in liberal arts, basically. Yeah, but you skipped over the whole part about the engagement and the wedding and dad going oh, well, up here in a blizzard. Well, that's sure. coming up. Oh, I thought that was part of the... Second question, what kind of an idiot drove a convertible in Montana? What? <laughs> well, it what was... What kind of idiot drove a convertible in Montana? Well, that was Alan's car, his brother's car. Oh. And Alan... Okay. Alan was in that the... That kind of idiot. Yeah. Alan was in the service at the time, and he sold the car to Ray because Alan was going to be overseas. So that's why Ray had a red convertible. All right, so... That's the best answer I could imagine. Yes. Yes. So here's, I'm, I think I might have the timeline wrong in my memory bank, but I thought, say, you got done in Denver, your first year of Denver school, you were in the park, the second year of Denver school, you're in the park. And then I thought, okay, so you were going to transfer to Missoula. And I thought that between that time 
after you finish the second year, when you, you know, in the, in the park. park, that you, that's when Dad got in the blizzard and came to uh, here. Your, your timeline is a little bit off. Oh, okay. Just a little bit. So did you go to Missoula first? I went to Missoula first and enrolled and started into the program. And Ray worked in the mercantile selling overalls. And I went to school, and I had a job. I had earned enough money that summer in Yellowstone to pay for my year of school. Wow. It was $600. That's a pretty big money back then. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I had saved part of the previous year's money, too. Wow. And I did a lot of babysitting in Denver. The college would let us babysit. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so you finish your two summers in Jellystone, and you graduate from CWC. You go to Missoula. You enroll, start taking classes. Dad's working. And then what? And I was working <laughs> as well as going to school. I had a waitressing job at behind the dormitory at Bill's, which was a little cafe. And the interesting part about waitressing there was that Bill accommodated two football players that were black. And he kept them in the basement. They had uh, beds in the basement at Bill's. And then they would come upstairs, and he would feed them at university expense because they were on scholarships. And so this is part of the football team. Those really? Two, and they were colored boys. Why would they come from colored world to rural Montana? Well, they came on a scholarship yeah. to, to play football at Missoula. It was part of the way the game worked. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I'm just rhetorically wondering what would bring them all the way out here. But go ahead. Um, one guy was named Severn Hayes, and he would order the same thing every single meal. And I, one time I said to Severn, well, why don't you order something else on the menu? And he said, well, what is there? I had to read the menu to him because he could not read. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my gosh. But I was, I was kind to him, and I would uh, yeah. suggest to him something else that might be good, and he'd order it. And then there was Ivory Jones, who was a big football player. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they ate there, and I waitressed there, and I got really mad at Bill because he hired um, a young waitress from Miles City, mm. and he paid her more than I was being paid. Oh, I was so mad at him. Was she a flirty little thing? Or do you well, know? she was cute. I know, she blonde, cute. Hmm. But... Uh, so they wouldn't then, let those black football players live on campus or eat on campus? No. With wow. before the civil I rights. I know, but that just seems so weird. That's the way it is in yeah. those days. Yeah. But he took them in. so Because um, he was getting money. Yeah, they were on scholarships. No, but he was getting paid by the university yeah. to house them. Yeah. How did that make you feel when you, you realized what was going on? It made me uncomfortable with it, the yeah. whole situation. And later on, I had a job as a secretary at the alumni office. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> and the lady running the alumni office was the mother of Archie Bunker's wife. Oh. So 
Archie Bunker, <laughs> Carol O'Connor, yes, <laughs> um, was frequently at the alumni office. He was an up-and-coming movie star, just beginning his career in L.A. Huh. And her daughter, they married him, and they lived down in California. And I think wow. they stayed married. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't so, follow his career that closely in his marriage in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I always thought that was an interesting connection later on. Yeah. So she was very nice, really lovely person. Yeah. So as I was finishing school, I was also working. And the second year, that my senior year, um, Ray and I decided to get married. And Luann was getting married. Oh, this is when you didn't get married during Lent. She got married in Iowa in a big fancy wedding because she was marrying somebody of note in Iowa City. And I think Chris has a question. You have a question, Chris? Well, I, I do. It's a general question on this topic, and it's one that I actually had written down, and, and you can get to it, but I'd like to know when, where, and how did Dad propose marriage to you? Uh, oh, okay. When, when, where, and how? Well, when... We were still in Yellowstone Park that second year. He p gave me his fraternity pin. So that's a, sort of a commitment mm -hmm. when you wear a fraternity pin. Because remember, he belonged to the SAE house. Yes, and he always, I asked him one time what SAE stood for, and he <laughs> said, sex above everything. And I thought, Oh, my God. <laughs> or sleep and eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so I got pinned when we were in Yellowstone Park, and he asked, uh, asked me if I would wear his pin. And because I didn't have any experience with fraternities or sororities at, in Denver, I thought, well, that's nice. I'll... I'll wear his pin. <laughs> but there was a hitch in the giddy up here because in Denver we had dances once a month and you had to dress up to go to the dances. And the, <laughs> um, the Air Force Base in Denver <laughs> would send a list to the social director of Colorado Women's College, and she would vet the members, they were all officers, second lieutenants, and she would vet them, and then they would be invited to come to the dance at CWC. <laughs> so the second year at CWC, this one guy was a really good dancer, and we got to dancing quite a bit together. And um, Ruby also, at that time, got connected with another one of the Air Force guys. And they would take us to the officers club at the air base to dance. Oh, my. So this guy, his name was Mike Horahevsky, and he was from Connecticut. And he was not quite as tall as I was. But boy, could he dance, and we had a lot of good dancing. And then he was, he was then going to go to Korea, and he said, would you write to me? And I said, well, yeah, I can do that. And so I wrote to him frequently, and he'd write back. I don't know what I ever wrote to him that gave him the idea that we would be married. But when he came back, from Korea, he drove from Connecticut to Gettysburg, South Dakota, and met my parents and said he was going to 
propose to me. What? Yes. Oh, God. I had, I had no idea. <laughs> oh, my God. Mom and Dad were just, what? Because that, you I had never mentioned that to him, to them. No, but you, they knew about Ray. Your mom and Dad knew you were dating Ray. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But they didn't know that Ray and I were as serious as we were. Yeah. You don't get all that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. Wow, so then he really came. Interesting. Then he came to Yellowstone or to Missoula, and thought I was he was going to give me an engagement ring. I thought, no, I'm pinned to this other guy. I'm committed to him. And he said, well, I thought you were going to marry me. Oh, this was all taking place in his car. <laughs> After he had given me all this jewelry and a lingerie set oh my from God. Japan. Whoa. And I said, no. <laughs> and he was just couldn't understand it. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought, oh, my gosh. I felt so bad for him, yeah. and I don't know what I had written. I was just chattering in college at a girls' school. What could I have written to him? I have no idea what he, where he got that idea, but he did. Oh, mother. <laughs> so anyway, he went on his way then. He drove all the way out from Connecticut. Uh-huh. Because he was being stationed at Moses Lake. Oh. So <laughs> it was on his way. <laughs> on the way to Moses Lake, Washington. So, Mother, when we left off, Dad had asked you to wear his fraternity pin. Right. <laughs> and then this other guy proposed to you. And yeah. so then what happened? And then what happened? Well, Mike Horahevsky <laughs> then went on to Moses Lake to his uh, uh, assignment. And Did you tell Dad about this? Eventually? Or not right away? Not right away, no. <laughs> Goodness, no. Did you ever so, tell him, though? I think eventually I did, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well... Only, only if he asked the right questions. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so then, uh, the second year then, we decided to get married while I was still in school. So my older sister got married before Lent. Lent is 48 days. So after Lent, after Easter, um, Ray and I decided to get married. And so they had been to Iowa to marry off Luann. And then they came to Montana to my wedding. And Barbara was in college at uh, Iowa, and she got on a bus and went to Chicago and took the train all the way to Missoula. So that was a big trip a long for her. Ride, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> my mother and father, I think, almost said no. Because? Because of the place we lived. Oh, I need to back up to when Ray met my mother and father. Yeah. It was spring break the year before we got married for Missoula, in Missoula. And um, I was home for spring break. And Ray was going to come and see me. Yeah. And he got on the train because his father was on the railroad and he had a pass. Mm -hmm. And he got on the train to go, go to Bismarck, North Dakota, and got off the train in a raging blizzard in Bismarck. <laughs> That's right. Then he was going to hitchhike his way down to Gettysburg. 
there was a bus that went from um, Tyr to Bismarck. But the bus left half hour before the train left. Oh, well, that's beautiful. Right. So he had to hitchhike. So he hitchhiked to the intersection where the road turned south into South Dakota. And there were no cars driving in the blizzard. And he stood on the road for I don't know how long in his winter storm coat, which yeah. he had sense to bring, and finally called on a payphone and said, I'm stuck here. Can you come and get me? <laughs> Can you come and get me? Uh -huh. Well, how far away were you? So I said, Dad, can we go get Ray? And he said, sure. So Mom and Dad and me got in the car, drove all the way up to North Dakota in this blizzard, picked him up, <laughs> and visited on the way home. <laughs> To get us work. Oh my God! And he was there for three days. And the artesian that water. Was, that was a really long drive. Yes, it was. Yeah. Go ahead. He was there for three days. He was there for three days, and we had artesian water. It was we could drink it, but it was pretty artesian, and. <laughs> uh oh. It was not did not agree with his insides. <laughs> so oh. he spent a great deal of those three days in the bathroom being indisposed. Why did you let him drink it? Well, we didn't have bottled water. Couldn't th what did, if you boil the water does it make a difference? The artesian water? No. I know nothing about it, so No, it just <laughs> you get used to it, you drink it. Your body okay. assimilates it. All right, so he spent three days in Gettysburg, half of it on the toilet, and then what happened? Then he got on the bus and went back to Bismarck. Okay. So, um, and then they came to Missoula for the wedding, and we were living in this little crummy apartment two rooms, a kitchen area, and a bedroom with a wardrobe and a dresser and a chair. You were living with him before you got married? No. Okay. This is where we would be living. Because that's where he was. Yeah. <laughs> and it had a water closet, had a toilet and a sink but no bathtub. So you were taking a French bath, which oh. means a washcloth yeah, bath. Yeah. So when they saw that, I think they thought they'd take me and go home. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the wedding pictures, they are not happy. But they went through, let me get married, Saw how in love I was. Yeah, um, so this is your dad walking you down the aisle. He's yes. not looking too joyful. Um, no, he's not. You look nice, though. You have to go on the tangent about where you got your wedding dress. Oh, yes. Well, I thought maybe I could borrow Luann's mm -hmm. wedding dress. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I didn't really want to because hers was so new. And it doesn't the, matter, they're only worn once. Yeah. <laughs> but Elva came to the rescue, and she was a great seamstress. And this is Dad's mom. This is Ray's mother. Okay. And she was really very, very generous and kind. Mm -hmm. So she said, Helen, I have to tell you this. I was shopping in Livingston, and in this bridal shop, they had this rack of dresses for sale. 
and she said, I saw this one, and I thought of you, and I bought it. It was ten dollars. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. And it had puffy sleeves. And I thought it was a lovely dress, except for the sleeves. And she said, well, I will alter them. I'll just yeah, change them so they're not puffy. Which I said, OK. And so she took it home with her, measured it all, and took it home with her. I don't think she had to do any other alterations. It's really except pretty. Except for the sleeves. Yeah. And. Um, yeah. So that's so, how you got your wedding dress. That's how I got my wedding dress. Yeah, and so, yeah. That was a very beautiful wedding dress. Yeah, yeah it, is. it is. That's a good story. Uh-huh. And the veil I borrowed from Creta McGuire. Oh. Because Bob was our best man and Ray and Creta and Bob were very good friends. Right. Initially. Yeah. Yeah. So. So here you are. After the wedding. After the wedding with all mm -hmm. your pose, posing pictures. Now, and then. Look how happy the parents are. <laughs> the mom and dad's with the bride and groom and they're all like, nah, except mom and Ray are happy. Yep. Except so, Dad, Ray has his eyes closed. <laughs> What? Yeah. Dad has his eyes closed. He looks half drunk, but yeah, I don't know. Dads are almost closed too, and mother's thinking, "Oh, my dear girl." <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. So then we moved into that lovely little apartment, and we got it for ten dollars a month because Ray was supposed to be taking care of the furnace. This was in the back of a big house mm -hmm. where there were rentals, a couple of rentals. And it was a sawdust furnace, sawdust burner. And the sawdust would get packed and not go into the furnace because it was damp. And so you had to go down and poke the sawdust back into the furnace so it would burn. Mm -hmm. and. People would get cold in the middle of the night, and they'd bang on the wall and said, get down there in that furnace room. <laughs> they would really get quite irritated. But they'd bang on the wall, and that's what they were Jeez. banging for. So he had to get up and go downstairs in the middle of the night, take care of the furnace. But that's why we got it for $10 a month. Yeah. Well, you know what? You have to back up because you skipped over. How did Dad propose to you? Chris asked oh, you. Oh, yeah. When, where, and how? Well, after after he pinned me, I didn't know that there was a tradition, 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 tradition <laughs> of the fraternity to come and sing a romantic song to the person that was pinned. Yep. And I was upstairs in the dorm room um, studying, and somebody came upstairs and said, you're supposed to be downstairs in the lounge. There's singing to you. And <laughs> I said, what? Because nobody had told me about this at all. So it was a complete surprise to me. <laughs> so I stood there and smiled, and they sang these sweet love songs. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the song was, but it was a love song. It was something new to me again. Right. I had no clue about it. <laughs> so then, after that, um, and we were known then as a, an official couple. He finally got up the nerve to say, would you marry me? And where were you when he asked you that? The ironic part was I was in his car, parked in front of the dorm. Oh. So romantic. 
<laughs> well, and I said, of course. <laughs> and so he was so happy. His folks were in town at that point. And he went over to their motel room, and Elva told me later she had never seen him so happy. Oh, Right, so. That's great. Yeah. Oh. So, so what the, when was that that he asked you? Because you were married in the spring. When did he ask well, you? Well, it was probably fall semester that year. Okay. Before. Cool. Yeah. And here's a picture of you in the snow on McDonald Pass. Yeah, we went to Helena one time to visit John Aker. Oh, okay. And uh, went over McDonald Pass, and that's the top of the Continental Divide. And Ooh. so I got out and he took my picture. Yeah, you're in lovely little rubber snow boots, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very fashionable. Your <laughs> beautiful red coat, your hair. Oh, yes. Now, oh, here's the picture of Dad and his family. It's this Ray's family. Yeah. Mother so. Elva, big brother Alan. Older brother, you should say. Older brother, he wasn't mm -hmm. bigger. Mm -mm. Walter, the father. And Raymond, and look at this nice bow tie. Yeah. <laughs> I think he was like in high school. Probably this was late, late high school or early college. Mm -hmm. He stayed out of college a year to work in a lumber mill to earn some money. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh. Ah. A lumber so. mill with no earplugs. What? Yeah. The lumber no. ear mill with no earplugs, which started to contribute to his death. Yep. Yeah. And then here is a lovely picture of Dad with your family as grown-ups. Right. Well, was that when you got engaged, maybe, or sometime? I'm not sure where... Uh, no, I think he was, we were married. And this okay. is probably our first trip back to South Dakota. Hmm. Interesting. And this is even an earlier family picture when we were still in Selby. And yeah, oh, cause Barbara still young. and mother and dad and Luann and Helen and Corbin on the floor. Yeah. So I don't know who took the picture. Cause your dad's not even looking at the camera. Grandpa's not looking at the camera. No. Nobody's smiling, really. Well, you hardly wanted to move for whoever had the camera. Yeah. It was still like that. Yeah. You had to be still. Still. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the end of all the slides, but I know Chris might have a few more questions and discussion that he wants to do. So, Christopher, if you have more comments, questions, you know, whatever. Anna, if you have any. I have a couple of fun questions for the lightning round. The lightning round, okay. <clears throat> Something that's important to our family history is tell us about you and Dad's involvement with the development of Red Lodge Ski Hill. Oh, well, after they had developed the ski hill, uh, they Which need... Was 1960. Okay. That's when they opened it. Remember okay. before that, there was a, a small one called Grizzly Peak that was, uh, when you're going up the Ski Hill Road from on, West was, Fork? 
It was called Silver Run. Silver Run, yeah, sorry. It was on that little yeah. face, but, you know, it was so okay. sunny and wet that it didn't last very long, so I know that much. Well, it would be kind of fun. That's where I learned how to ski when I was four years old. And at Red Lodge Mountain? No, at Silver Run. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Across the little wayside over there? Oh, way on the other side of the valley. That was Sundance. That was oh, a little... Yeah, okay. Never yeah. Mind. That one, that that doesn't exist anymore. That's where I learned how to ski on my little red plastic skis. But <laughs> Yeah. Um, it would be fun to learn about your and dad's involvement with uh, early Red Lodge Mountain. Well, um... They needed a, a ski patrol, and we were on um, a single salary at that time because Ray had was just finishing school, his master's degree, and um, so in order to be able to ski, you. You could join the um, ski patrol, and then you would ski free. Right. But you would be committed to duty on the ski patrol, which meant quite a bit of training. Yeah. So Dad did that for, uh, and he was on ski patrol quite a few years before I joined the auxiliary. Oh, okay. And. Uh, so that's basically how we got involved was the skiing. Because it was because because dad was a skier before that? Yes, he was. They skied in when he was in Helena, he learned to ski. And then in uh, Missoula had a little ski run. And so he liked to ski. It was uh -huh, oh, yeah. part of his life. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good thing for our family, I thought. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the most interesting things you did when I was young in grade school was you made a whole bunch of styrofoam Christmas tree ornaments. Right. What was your inspiration for that? Well, I had seen them at a craft fair. And at the time, the m newspaper was using strips of plastic that was about a quarter of an inch mm -hmm. thick and all, all yeah. in strips. And so one of the friends from church um, her husband worked at the newspaper, and when they didn't need those plastic strips, she would bring them over, and I'd trace on them, and he made a cutter for me with a hot guitar wire and a little box. Okay, okay. Wait a minute. That kind of, you've already explained how the egg hatched, but where did the whole idea for the styrofoam ornaments, and how did you know about the styrofoam, and how did Dad know how to build a hot wire cutter? Well, he just and figured why, it out. And why were you so good at it? <laughs> well, because I was good. I would draw. Uh, sometimes I would trace a figure. Sometimes I would just draw it, uh, see a small figure, and enlarge it a bit. But... Um, I did it because I thought it would be fun, and it turned out to be very popular. Yeah. Uh-huh. There are people that still have those ornaments. Yeah. Pattons do, Spaldings do, and, we do. And the paint, uh, they took, the plastic took the paint very well. It took yes. acrylic paint, yeah. Do you remember the year you stayed up all night painting ornaments before the church bazaar? Yeah. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So, Dad thought I was crazy at that point. <laughs> he did. 
to stay up all night. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Okay, one, one last quick question, because I know you're really tired and you guys have to move on, but after you and Dad both retired, you traveled all around the world. What do you think was your favorite place to go? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's a hard one. You went everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what were some of the highlights? I mean, what sticks out in your mind is, well, yeah, what, what, what one, things really stuck out in your mind? The first time we went, we went with the Pattons on a tour. And when we, we flew into London, and the tour leader, or whoever met us, um, said, would you like to see Parliament? And they're in session right now. So we went to Westminster Abbey to the Parliament, or not the, the Abbey, House of but Parliament. the Parliament, and sat in the gallery and watched the House of Lords saying aye or nay. Or arguing with each other. <laughs> uh -huh. It was quite interesting, very interesting. and um, Especially for Dad. Yeah. And then, yeah, and in the Parliament. Guy Patton would have loved that too. Yeah. yeah. There right. was, um, there was this huge room, a common room, that um, Henry the Eighth used, and in one end of it there were doors, double doors, for the horses could come in there, and. Uh, it must have been a real mess, <laughs> but it was a very large room and very historic, and vaulted ceilings and stained windows and uh, oak mm -hmm. wainscoting, etc. So that was uh, the beginning of our tour of England that time. That was the first and last time Patton's ever traveled. Yep. That's too bad. And we stayed in a hotel across from Kensington Palace. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so besides that very first trip, what else, what other highlights stick out in your mind? You go, oh gosh, well, that was great. Of course, the trip to Nepal because it was such a different culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> the third world culture really hit me in the face because I wasn't used to it. But Dad had ha experienced Pakistan, so he said, well, be ready for it. And I said, OK. And he said, no, that's what it's like. <laughs> As we started up the street with everything, other, other every other conveyance in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From goats to sheep to motorcycles or motor mopeds, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, carts. Yeah, I'm surprised that you guys were mobile enough to keep yourselves out of harm's way in Nepal. But well, they were a lot younger. Pretty impressive. They were much younger and yeah. agile, Chris. And Nepal yeah, wasn't in... They were still fairly senior. <laughs> and Nepal wasn't in such a state as it is these days. Yeah. Yeah. No. What else, brother? Well, I'm hoping that we can uh, go back and add like little comments and maybe things. Yeah, I mean, this is, we'll figure to out. Add to this narrative because she said so many things that would like a little comment here and there would clarify things. And yeah. Plenty of spots for sarcasm to be introduced. But yeah, that's well, just me. <laughs> that's your MO. Well, you got to realize you're kind of doing it. I think you guys have done a great job, and I don't think uh, you need to change a thing. Well, it's kind of been like a fly by the seat of your pants. It hasn't really had any structure of a significant sort, so that's kind of what we're working out as a, a bigger picture of all this. So, yeah. And Harvey uh, I is... I think you've been a, a good interviewer, and Mom has been a good uh, interviewee. Her stories are funny, entertaining, and thorough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. 
And Harvey has been just a paragon of patience doing this. <laughs> yep. Yep. And it's, he's finding all of the things he can incorporate into the next group that, the yeah. next person that he interviews, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, yeah. This, this could never have happened without you, Harvey. That's a, it's awesome that you've done this. And yeah. And I will have this for all of posterity. Yeah. Yep. We will. Really interesting. Mm hmm So that's what life was like 88 years ago. Yeah. 80 years ago and on up. Yeah. It has been a very interesting story. Yeah, it I've has. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you, Mom. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you so much. I learned so much, you guys. Yeah. Well, Good. You'll learn more when you listen to the other pieces you haven't heard. And when you come in the fall, we can... What? Is this the third one you've done? This is... Set, um, our section four, three, three point two. Yeah. 4.2. I don't know. Yeah. yeah so. Oh, you this three hour cruise has turned into about a 12 hour journey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a three hour tour. The three hour tour. Yep. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so. Thank you, Harvey, for your patience. You're welcome. <laughs> Of course. Yep, of course. So we'll see you in the fall, Anna, and we'll go over some more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I'm going to, we're going to take this interview and we're going to do our own Mystery Science Theater 3000. Okay. <laughs> you do that. Oh, that would be frightening. <laughs> we all sit in front of the screen and make sarcastic comments, yeah. <laughs> And that's my family. <laughs> yep. So, Anna, I'm going to call you back later. I want to hear the update on your foot. Yeah. Unless you have other things you need of me, i got to go check my garden. It's really hot outside. So. Okay. You do that, brother. Thank you for your yeah. Love you. Love you. input. Right. Love you guys. Thank you for including me again. Have a good night. You too, Anna. Okay. Love you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Should I hit?